gentlemen, join Mythician's Patreon, not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars and you're helping Myth Vision grow. We just like came off an amazing mythos deep dive onto some, oh my gosh. Anyway, you mentioned Blade Runner and you want to slap me and I don't blame you because I've never seen the di- I was astonished. To hear <laughs> Richard, that. Yeah. what is Blade don't, Runner? Don't what know. Is- and then I was like, oh my God, I have to explain the plot to Blade Runner to even get to the point I wanted to make. Um, so for those who have not seen Blade Runner, uh, this is a movie in the 80s starring Harrison Ford, set in the future uh, and there are these replicants, uh, androids, fa- artificial people uh, that were built to be slaves. And so the, it's basically a slave society, right? So there's a whole narrative here about slave societies and, and how we privilege and so on. But the, you know, of course, slaves have a tendency to rebel, right? Nobody wants to be a slave. So one of their solutions is, is to not give them emotions. So if they don't have emotions, then they can control them is their idea. The problem is, is that they started to grow emotions. They started to f- figure motions out over time. And so they said, well, we got another problem. So they like solve that by giving them a limited lifespan, four years. They terminate automatically. They die after four years. The thing is, of course, they still build emotions up to that point. And so in the movie, the the premise of the movie is that one group of these androids that's about to die, uh, they know their time is up. It's coming up and they've grown emotions and they have their, and, but they're, they're basically children. You think like they're four year olds, essentially, in terms of their emotional development. And but and they're not and these these uh, slave synthetic people are not allowed to be on Earth. But so they for some reason uh, kill people, kill their masters, and steal a ship and go to Earth. We don't know why. They, they don't know why. They just know they're there and they got to get rid of them. So they hire a Blade Runner, uh, or basically coerce a Blade Runner. It's someone who goes around killing synthetic humans who rebel. Hire him to go kill them all. Basically, go find them and kill them. And that's that's Harrison Ford's job. His character's job in the movie. Uh, so basically, you've got the hero of the movie. His job is to go kill a bunch of children who are escaped slaves in, in defense of the slave owning society. So this is very much an anti-hero type narrative, right? There's a lot of other aspects of the movie where he is not a heroic character, really. If you actually pay attention to what's going on in the movie, um, the actual heroes are these child slaves, basically. Um, and even though they do terrible things too, they're doing them in pursuit of well, the pursuit of trying to they're trying to find a solution to their termination. They want to live longer than four years. And their whole mission really, it turns out, is they were trying to get to the corporation, the head of the corporation who built them to make him uh, take away the whatever it is that's causing them to die. Anyway, so it, so he, meanwhile, Harrison Ford's character is killing them all. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're trying their best to achieve their objective. And finally, you know, like the lead, the, the guy, uh, the lead synthetic played by Rutger Hauer, finds uh the, finally gets to the corporate leader and goes through this whole tense conversation about can you save me basically the the guy explains scientifically point by point is like there's nothing we can do you're just gonna die i'm sorry uh and so uh, uh batty roy batty this, this synthetic character kills him right and so basically this is a whole narrative of a man enraged by his mortality going to bitch about it to god god can't do anything about it so he kills his god basically man kills god it's very much narrative for civilization right so um anyway so that happens and then there's a final confrontation where uh harrison ford's character deckard is trying to kill uh this one last uh synthetic uh Roy batty and so they have this but these these slaves are built to be superhuman so this is a really challenging thing to do right so Decker's getting his ass kicked, like he's doomed, basically. There's one point where he, like, jumps across a building and he's literally dangling by his fingers, 40 stories below, he's, he's gonna die, he's done, done for. Roy Batty easily leaps over the same <laughs> chasm, right? It's because he's superhuman, no problem. And he, you see there's a scene where he's looking down at the guy who's murdered everybody he loves, uh, he's defending the slave society, and he's finally defeated him and he's about to die. And you expect him to, like, stomp on his fingers or watch him fall or whatever, right? And what happens is, like, like he does lose his grip, and he's going to fall, but he saves him. He rescues him. He pulls him up, and he puts him down, and he t- explains why he just saved him, like, why he did that. And it's an extremely, like, emotionally moving scene. Uh, and wow. and this whole, he gives this whole narrative. It's probably one of the most famous, like, final death scene narratives uh, in cinema. And I won't do it justice. You've got to watch it to really okay. get it. But I, I'll summarize. The, the basic gist is, is, like, I've been fighting like hell for more life to, to not die. And 
it would be a betrayal of my values if I were to let you die. Like, like that would be like, why, why should I be fighting so hard for my life if I'm not going to fight for anyone else's life? Essentially, life is valuable. So I'm not going to let that happen. And so it was an expression of his values. It's the reason why I saved you is because I want to save something. You know, it's like, I, this is an expression of my values, basically. Ultimately. If I can't save myself, I might as well try to save well, someone. Well, yeah, like, if I, if I let you die, well, how is that any different from you letting me die? Like, that, that's basically... Now, he doesn't put it in those terms. It's a much more poetic ending. But, right, right. Um, so he, he basically gives this speech, and he talks about... He gives this really passionate speech about all these wonderful things he's seen in his life, how fantastic life has been, and how sad it is that it's going to go away. And he's, you know, what the famous line that he says is like... Uh, you know, all those memories that I have are all going to disappear like tears and rain, essentially. Wow. Uh, and, and, and this is in rain. By the way, it's raining when this oh. happens. Uh, and as soon as he finishes explaining this, he expires. Because he knew, he, he knew for a fact that he was going to die in a few minutes. So he was looking down at the guy that he you know, had every reason to kill. This whole, he represents the entire system that's been killing him. And, and he knows he's going to be dead himself in 30 seconds, and so, or a minute or whatever. And so he says... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna realize the values that your freaking society wouldn't realize for me, basically, is, is, is the message that he did. Mm. And for me, that is such a, a beautiful expression of why humanism believes in morality, why we believe it is important to be moral. What, what actually is the moral source for us? It is that kind of thinking. So we don't need the story to be true. I don't need there to be a real Roy Batty who said this, all right? Like, like is it still, the, the story and the narrative is still... Powerful. All of the messaging of it is still true, right? Like, in, in, if in these circumstances, if that happened, that's exactly right. Uh, that, that is how someone should behave, right, in the end. so If I may, and I'd love to get your take on this. This is wonderful, by the way. Just you telling that got me emotional, just so you know. Right. That's uh, how, and, and, and I By the way, I'll that. emphasize, I am doing a shitty job of <laughs> right. <laughs> compared no, but to the I art. Can... The art is, does it very beautifully. I, I really... really I empathize to that, and I could feel. I got to watch it now. You really got me thinking. Is the newer version something? They're or both very excellent the... for very different reasons. Okay. Uh, both films are excellent, but the one I'm talking about is the original '80s version. Okay. I do recommend seeing the final edit. There's what do they call it now? Um, the final cut. I think they call oh, it the like final the, cut. Is it upgraded version of the old one. Uh, so it's a long story of how the studio forced them to do certain things in the movie. The director didn't like it. There okay. were mistakes made in the movie. Uh, that they wanted to fix, etc. So there's been many versions oh, wow. uh, that have tried to fix these things. And so the final cut, I think, is the best one okay. of all of them. I'll look it up. Darren Brown, he's a mentalist. One of my favorite uh, examples in modern times right now, he debunks in the most. He takes a scalpel. It's like, I don't know if you've heard about, um, I, I use the term scalpel when someone's really critically doing something. You don't even realize it because it's such a clean cut. You're already, it's already open. There's a BBC show that he does, right? Yes, multiple shows, by the he, way. The, have you, I don't know if you've seen this, but he um, he shows how con artists work, basically. Oh, uh, beyond that. Showing you... the psychology, showing how you can trick yes. people into thinking things, how you can trick people oh, into right? remembering no, things. Okay, so he's a real magician, right? He's up there with the best, but he's also a mentalist. So he knows how to make you think what he wants you to think, and then acts like he's reading your mind, but really... Everything he everything he does, he knows what he's doing. And I mean, like, this is how good he is. He went, he did episodes where he went to real tarot card and like people who were really like saying they are talking to dead people and he's going on this audition and he does better than them in it, in this group of people and they're crying <laughs> and this experience he gives them. Yeah. So I'll tell you the best one, my favorite one. I don't want to get into all of it, but I want to get your take on this to get the idea going to have you part of this conversation because I love this. Darren Brown did an episode on converting an atheist and he found this woman. He got like four or five people who went down to the bottom of this church, pitch black, right? Has a camera on them. They don't know it's there. It's completely like, it looks like a little like torture dungeon down there. There's like bricks falling on the walls. It's so black and dark. And they're in there and they're like, what was that? They're starting to freak out. Like there's things there and they're starting to experience things. Pitch black. Nothing's going on. Nothing's there. You see the room with the camera, but they're panicking. And like something was right behind me. And like they're all freaking out. But this one girl comes in. She goes, I feel very comfortable. I feel at home. I feel at peace. And he's like, okay. So she's a skeptic. Finds out she's an atheist. She's a scientist too. She works in some thing. As a na she's more of a naturalist, right? He gets her into this church. He plays that he's this 
kind of figure that's not only very charismatic, but an emotional guy who might be connected to a deity like Jesus, but he doesn't come out like a Jesus freak or anything. And he starts to talk about her. So part of this documentary we're doing, they're filming the whole time, tell us about your dad. He starts to bring up real things, real things about her life. And she's getting worked up and he's tapping things, not even knowing that he's doing things to her. She doesn't even realize it about her dad being her hero and like the most amazing real stuff. But then he's, he's taking you through the process of saying, now this is where I'm going to plant the God seed. Watch what happens. And like, he literally does this thing where he's like, you ever just at that moment, you felt like it was just time. It was just, it was that, that moment that you knew, like he does something right. Then he gets up and he, he's like, I'm going to go get some water. He walks away. She's sitting down and she stands up and she's oh, just starts to cry. And she's like looking up at Jesus on this cross right in front of her. And she starts to cry. An atheist in less than 15 minutes, he converts her to become a believer. It was the most real thing I've ever seen. So then he brings her on the show and he says, now I want you to know everything you felt was real. I gave that to you though. All of it was real things that I tapped into and there, and no God needed. I want you to know that you, you attached it to the thing I wanted you to have it attached to. So the things Christians are doing, they do it sincere, but they're attaching it to the wrong things that aren't factual in that sense. So if they learned a way in their, in their world, and this is the difficult part about the in-group, out-group, social identity, all that, how can we bridge that gap? of tearing down the social identity that causes racism, that causes the hate groups, the in, the out, and all that, and still give people a mythos that they can believe in. Uh, I, uh, I, I want to come at this very important question from a little different angle, and then I'd like you both to respond to it in terms... I want to define how I understand my atheism. My atheism is the opposite of, athe of theism for me is not materialism. The opposite of theism is not nihilism. The opposite of theism is humanism. And human life gets shaped meaningfully by art by you, the, the Blade Runner for you, for this thing for you. And I don't know how the universe comes to about, and I trust physicists to help me understand it. And I also don't know that I understand everything about transcendence or life. I do know that the typical way of talking about intelligence or metaphysics and so on is just not interesting to me and it's not because I'm a materialist and it's not because I'm a nihilist it's because I'm a humanist and I want to understand the role of art and beauty and so I'm um, for me aesthetics is the most important moral ingredient to understanding human life and to, to put a finer point on your question, I think it's fair to say that racism is ugly. Me too. I think economic disparity and poverty is ugly. I think war is ugly. And I think if we can have, and, and I think we learn about that because of art mm -hmm. and the yeah. value of life and the danger of deception. Um, in these things, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I sound like a preacher, but I <laughs> am so tired of people thinking that I'm an atheist because I'm a nihilist, or a relativist, or uh, a materialist. Right. That is not the opposite of theism. Mm -hmm. The opposite of theism is humanism, and by the way, this goes way back into Greek philosophy. This yeah. is not a mm -hmm. new idea. This is yeah. pre-Socratic. Mm. 
and um, Tim Whitmarsh. Even and, and I think the we need to have a recovery of moral beauty as humanists, and to say. I'm not going to give any ground to you fucking theists on issues of morality, because your theism right now is causing more problems in the in the in Thank the you. world than my humanism. Yeah, yeah. yeah you go first, Richard. I, I just got done talking before him. <laughs> I'd love to hear your. No, I agree with everything you just said. Yeah, yeah. I don't think For any long. of us are nihilist, and and you know, you're one hundred percent right about the way you approach this, and I think, for me. My atheism is obviously realizing this expanded. Remember, I told you my deconversion came at realizing we're all trying to touch the same thing. So I thought, oh, that's evidence of God. But then I said, okay, maybe deism or pantheism, right? I started getting into weird areas to try and understand it. Possibly could be true. But then I said to myself, hold on, what's the difference between atheism and deism for me? One is, I think something started the damn thing and then turned away and went somewhere else. But I have no evidence of that thing other than I look around and go, wow, this is awe-inspiring and I can't put it together. Because, you know, as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, the universe does not have the requirement to make sense to you. It's not, it's not like you're born and it's like, oh, hi, I'm the universe and I need to make sense to you. No. We, and it won't make sense. Right. Yeah. It, there's too much we don't quite grasp. But for me, I'm an atheist because I have no evidence of God. Like, for me, right? And then um, the next step, though, is, okay, so here we are. What do we do with this? And right. you need humanism something. evolves from answering that question with what is actually factually available, which is us helping each other build a better society. And, and I that, think that's, that's really all there is. It's, there's nothing left. N there's no one coming to save us. Uh, we have to save ourselves, so we better get on that, is basically. And that requires understanding the truth of the world. If you want to figure out a solution to a problem, you have to know what the problem really is. You have to know that it exists. So, you know, you can't solve racism if you keep denying that it even exists, for example. You have to understand what actually does solve racism, like empirically, what is actually going to help. Uh, you know, so that's the, and that's the humanist mode, right, that's is to right. figure that out. Uh, and then, so that's why, like, when you see art, you can see, uh, so I have a model and the idea of good and bad art. Um, sure, good and bad music, good and bad religion. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could say in terms of, like, there's good and bad in terms of technical measures, right? And you, know, you, can, you can make a lousy movie because you just suck at holding a camera or whatever. <laughs> but, the, but there's a different sense of good and bad, which is, uh, is the values that are represented in the story and the narrative that you're telling, do they correspond to reality? Is this... Is this if that really happened, is that how it would proceed? Or is that the value of what we want to proceed? Or is that what we should want to proceed? Versus, for example, you look, you know, people are super fond, fond, some people are super fond of Ayn Rand, right? And she wrote these novels. These, and that was her view of art, too, is through fiction she could represent her ideal society, right? But if you read, like, Atlas Shrugged or whatever, like, it's so contrary to reality. None of the stuff that happens in there would actually happen, right? It's, it's so ignorant of how economic laws work how human psychology works, uh, what people actually even think for real. Um, so it, it's, it's this art that I think it's bad art in the sense that it, it's selling a view of the world and a, a way of fixing the world that is completely false and will not work and in fact will make everything worse. Uh, whereas good art, like the best art, is the kind that gets it right, that represents, and it's, it's like Blade Runner is an example of that, like, that will never happen. I doubt there will ever be such a society that those specific people, none of those specific things are likely to ever happen. But if they did, like if all of the stuff presented in that movie happened, the, the course of events is is plausible, but also it represents what you would want to occur, right? Like like by the resolution of it, it's like this really does represent where things should have gone. Now, you might even say I could have fixed this earlier on by – you know, teaching some people some stuff earlier on and so on. But of course, we know that's not how reality works. Reality works is you have to go through this struggle and make these mistakes to figure out what is it that you're supposed to actually understand about life and how you should behave. And its ultimate, you know, moral message is correct, I think. So I mm -hmm. think it's really nailing how you get to that point. And, and notice, you know, Roy Batty didn't think he was going to live forever. He didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe in God. But he still did the right thing in the, in the end. Like he finally came to that realization and said, this is the kind of person I want to be for these reasons and the reasons are real they actually correspond yeah. to reasons that correspond to us and so to me that's how art can be very powerfully you have this totally fictional completely radically fictional made up story that accurately captures the reality of, of the lessons we want people to learn 
and and that would make the world better if they did learn and and for, it factually would and not right. just that we believe they would but they really would uh and so that's that to me is like the difference between like art that is actually caustic and toxic versus art that is actually positive and accurate and and helpful for moving society forward i think that's perfect well said and then the humanism thing is what i believe in now so like <laughs> it's based on reality it's based on evidence and you know, I watched this really interesting clip. I had to I had to download it and put it on my Facebook, um, Myth Vision, with um, Christopher Hitchens. He was asked during his debate with Frank Turek by one of the audience members. And the audience member, when you see him ask the question, you can tell he's a theist, number one. And not just any normal, regular, oh, I'm a theist. This guy looked like Hardcore. he was ready to hurt Hitchens. <laughs> and he's rocking his chair, kind of asking the question, has his leg over, moving frantically. And he says... If you don't believe in God, what's the point? Why are you here tonight? Why are you wasting your time? Go home. Like, that's kind of the way he asked it. And he's like, what did he say? And Christopher's laughing like, what did he say? Because he thinks it's funny. You know, like, he's he's not afraid of anyone with their their crazy, uh, obsessive ideas. And then he jabbed very hard into Christianity, Islam, and these other religions, these theism religions, in a way that I have to say, it was very militant in the sense of, he was aggressive in what he said in his tone, not as if, like, we need to do this and militarily go and attack these people or anything like that. But he said, when your cult preaches death and the idea that the end is soon and you can't wait for this world to be over because all you worry about is the next one and all you're concerned about is that next world to a point where you're ready for an apocalypse to happen or, like, what we see in Islam, things that happen. He goes, these death cults and these ideas... Of course I want to get rid of them. They're evil. And he's like looking and he's getting militant, like aggressive, letting a guy like, you're not scaring me, buddy. Your beliefs are not good beliefs to have. And that's my hope is to take someone from me where I was nine years ago to where I am now. Yeah. I'm not only so much more balanced in my life. I understand why I thought what I thought nine years ago. But I know I wish I could just turn that switch off for people and go, okay, they think you just want everyone to stop believing in anything. And it's like, right. no. No, no, no. We want you to yeah, replace absolutely. it. The, the, the slot needs to be filled. You still need that operating software. That's, <laughs> you just need better software instead of this buggy stuff. Uh, we don't want to shut you off and like turn remove all the software. <laughs> no, we want a better operating system is what right. we want. And, and humanism is, is the one that we think is going to work. Of course, our understandings of the good and the beautiful are going to be subjective and, and different. Right. And evolve and, over time as we learn. And, and they evolve over time. But um, uh, I'm reminded of um, some of the dialogues of Socrates in Plato, where there's a concern. You, you can't, in translating Plato, you sometimes don't know whether kalos means the morally good or the beautiful. And it's because I became convinced that Socrates did not make a distinction between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the good and the beautiful are the same. But he knows that that is a subjective judgment. Mm -hmm. He's not claiming divine revelation, that he knows what's there. And then you have this uh, wonderful passage in the symposium where... The highest love is the love of transcendence, and um, where it's it's not a physical love, it's not the, the world, but it's this, and it, he's taught it by an old prostitute, by the way. Um, she knows a thing you know, to do. Who knows about love, right? But it's this this highest love, and I think that that kind of I don't know what the good is but i know what is beautiful for me and one of the reasons that i miss the social organization of a church is i want to have more organizations that are that share my values and my sense of beauty that we can change and i think society in especially in american society which i know the best has to evolve new institutions of identity that have political clout and so on, where certain values of beauty, of um, getting rid of white supremacy, for example, or economic... I mean, we all know what these, this liberal agenda is. 
but it really is hard to know what the social adhesive is going to be to hold us together to get us done politically. I mean, we can think about the Supreme Court in Texas. Right oh now. my gosh, I don't even so, want to know that right now. Um, but um, I think what your experience was is really valuable almost as a metaphor for um, this conversation. Namely, you found a new freedom and an ability to find beauty in life and, um, and to break the chains of a bondage of a theism that was bad religion. And by the way, I'm not against religion. I'm happy for good religion. I'm so fucking tired of bad religion, I can't <laughs> tell you. Yeah. And um, so, uh, I, but I think your experience is kind of a metaphor of an awakening to your own sense of what's, what mean, what life is for you. Yeah. What, what is beautiful for you. I felt like it was an addiction. I really did. I mean, my heroin addiction and painkillers and everything else I had struggled with all these years, every time I'd get off of them, I'd go right back to Jesus and just be obsessive about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out a balance. Yeah. Now I figured it out when I let go. That's good. When yeah. I found comfort in the unknown and like literally took a leap when I was afraid and then found out it wasn't scary. It's the craziest thing. I, I can't imagine. Imagine if, if this is all like, uh, like imagine you die and, and you're just terrified at that moment. <laughs> you're dying and you know, and this is it, like like Blade Runner. And then all of a sudden, just imagine. I mean, this is speculation, of course, completely. I'm not trying to play a theistic idea. Sure, here, yeah. You go to the other side and you're like, that wasn't bad at all. That wasn't bad. Whatever the hell the other side is. What, what was I afraid of? That's how it felt for me when I left theism. I thought of death. It was a death to my world. Like heroin was going to kill me. I had to stop shooting up heroin. I was dying. And I went through a symbolic death in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to myself all the time on my lives on MythFish and saying, Derek, nine years ago, listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm trying to say to that. I want Derek to be symbolic of all the theists that watch my channel to go... I understand if you want to believe that's fine. Like you talk about good religion. I have a hard time knowing what that is. Uh, well, I don't know what that is. But you know it is what it is for you. You know if it's you know you have values enough to know if it's destructive. Yes, but here I guess and my own experience with religion, I know good people who are religious people. I don't know of good religion from my own experience. I know good that's people. Fair enough. That's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. But I also want to, to say that people who do ethics say that it's very, and this goes also back to Plato in his Republic. Right. It's very difficult to know what justice is. It's very easy to know what injustice is. Right. Why? Because it's ugly. Mm. And I think we have to, instead of saying, what is the beautiful, we have to have a new sensitivity to what is not beautiful. What is the ugly? What do we, what do we need to struggle for to, to, yeah. to have our values uh, reflected yeah. in the world? If I may end on this, because we've got one minute left. It's a minute and like 20 seconds. I think humans, I'm a humanist. You're a humanist. You're a humanist. I think humans are inherently good. And I think, personally, most religions, I'm not going to say all, I don't know this. I haven't studied everything there is under the mm -hmm. sun. There's wonderful people who practice religions and they paint a good picture for those religions. I don't think religions in and of themselves are good or bad. I think people are good, but a lot of the ideologies that they do practice and believe corrupt people. Absolutely. And so it's my opinion that if we all got on this the same bandwagon we're talking about here and we're able to evolve and educate ourselves a little i think we would stop letting go of or we start letting go of these ridiculous really absurd ideas um to me people are good and they don't need religion in order to be that that's my opinion i agree yep absolutely I agree. So, thank you cool.